morning, uh, Rod. Good morning. Uh, this is uh, John Onrick and Rod Flowers, and uh, it's uh, my great pleasure to talk to Rod today. Uh, Rod uh, works for SunTrust and uh, consistently uh, cranks over uh, six million a month, and is uh, way up there and has been for a long time. Uh, Rod, before we get into your professional career, uh, most of the contemporaries out there, uh, they always want to know a little bit about your background and where you came from, went to school, and uh, and just how you got into the business. Uh, the reason is everybody has a unique story. Well, I grew up on the eastern shore in Salisbury, Maryland. Um, Which is where? Near uh, Ocean City? Near Ocean City, mm -hmm. about a half an hour from Ocean City. Mm -hmm. um, uh, went to college in Baltimore at Towson uh, University, uh, then graduate school at Loyola College to get my MBA. Um, so I was in Baltimore for about uh, 15 years, and then I was asked to um, uh, take a mortgage position um, on the eastern sh back in the eastern shore, coincidentally, um, uh, to help uh, revamp the mortgage uh, business down there. It wasn't doing real great, and uh, it was a little bit chaotic, so I thought I would do it for two years, and that was almost 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, the way I got into mortgage business is um, a senior vice president of Loyola Federal Savings and Loan. I uh, remember me through sports. Um, I used to play about, uh, I was a four-letter man each year in high school and a three-letter man each year in college, so this person kind of knew me from growing up back in Salisbury, and I guess he felt that uh, discipline through sports could be applicable to the business world, I guess. So I think it is, actually. Yes, and, and it is, truthfully. Mm -hmm. um, so I decided back then, again, I figured I'd take the job for two years, learn something I don't know, get paid for it, and then decide what I want to do in the future, and that was about 24 years ago. So, uh, I find it a little bit unusual that uh, uh, someone with an MBA goes kind of directly into the mortgage banking business. You don't see that too often. Well, really, my I had gotten my MBA in uh, marketing mm -hmm. with a um, – that was my emphasis and then a minor in finance. Um, since I was in banking, per se, my first few years, my first – actually, my first uh, five years in banking as a branch manager, we were asked to do mortgages as well. We were actually asked to go out to the real estate offices. We were probably one of the first in the country to actually proactively call on realtor offices. And this is with Loyola Federal. This was Loyola Federal, and this was back in yeah. 1977 that they started making us do that. They would send uh, letters to the – we had to send a memo to the senior VP of the lending division every Friday, and then every Monday he sent a letter out to those offices uh, saying, I understand Rod Flowers was in your office last week. If you had any questions, call us. As kind of like a double check to make sure we were sure. going out to the offices. <laughs> so that's how I kind of uh, learned under fire about how, how the mortgage business worked. And because that proactive calling on the agents, we were the only guys doing it, our volume grew tremendously, and that's how I learned the mortgage business. Um, it's kind of like a, a commercial version of uh, uh, of the Jesuits watching over your brain and manipulating you. <laughs> that's right. Well, then after I uh, uh, managed one branch uh, for three years and then was uh, promoted to another branch about twice as large uh, for about three years and started getting my MBA, and that's when they branched off into the um, mortgage loan originator uh, loan officer position uh, that was on commission. Since I was in the midst of getting my MBA, I decided not to do that and stayed as branch manager at my branch so I could continue what I had started, thinking that I would go into advertising marketing because I'm fairly creative. And so when I did that, I was promoted downtown uh, to VP of the Advertising, Marketing, Public Relations Department. Mm -hmm. So I did that about three years, and then the, the senior VP of that division is the one that called me after work one day. He was from the Eastern Shore, and he said, well, do you ever think about going back to Salisbury? Uh, we need some help down there on the mortgage side, and you know it. And I actually told, I thought about it for uh, about a week and decided not to take it. And it's just like a test. You know, you don't, sometimes you don't realize something until you verbalize it. And as soon as I said no, I got that sick feeling in my stomach. I just made the wrong decision. You know, I was missing an opportunity. So about an hour later, I'd call back and change my mind. They had already booked two interviews with other loan officers. I said, well, that's fine. What's, what's fair is fair. And if it works out, it was meant to be. And they still chose me. And 
uh, like I said, I promised my wife we'd come back to Baltimore in two years, and mm-hmm. things worked out, and uh, it's worked out well. Yeah, I, I find that a little bit interesting, and I'll tell you why. It's uh, uh, ironically, I know a little of the history uh, of uh, Salisbury and uh, Ocean City and Ocean Pines and some of the places down there. And uh, ironically, when I sold computers for IBM, it, it was in Baltimore, so I know Baltimore well too. Which leads me to this question: well, Why would you consider going from an area? Uh, I won't necessarily call it the high price spread, but where the average volume amounts uh, or loan amounts, I'm sure, were higher into Salisbury, which, while uh, it, it has some depressed areas, also has some very nice areas, as you know. Uh, I'm sure the loan volumes were just uh, much lower than where you were coming from. Well, I wasn't really, uh, didn't really think in those terms. It was really the fact that I was making so little money as a VP of marketing uh, that, you know, I always felt that I could do more than just what I was doing in this nine to five job. Sure. And I, I mean, I was always doing things. I always had a second job. You know, my first years as manager, uh, five nights a week, I was a waiter or a bartender. Um, and then, as I when I worked downtown, I was always trying to start little businesses on the side, whether it was, uh, you know, whether it was Amway or A. L. Williams Life Insurance or whatever. Oh. I just had I just had energy. And then when they told me about this position, I looked at the potential volume and and asked what the potential volume was from the senior VP of the lending division and backed in from that commission structure and said, okay, well, I only have to do X amount of dollars to make more money than what I'm making now. And So it was a very rational decision. Right? Oh, yeah. Well, yeah, and then, then I realized I'm missing an opportunity. This is my chance to, you know, just take off. And, you know, am I really what I think I'm worth? Now's my chance to prove it. Instead of being boxed in in a salary structure, you know, and it's kind of frightening, I guess, for a person to go on commission, sure. and especially back when you were only getting a quarter of a point as your commission mm-hmm. structure. Mm-hmm. You know, so I said, well, I'm not worth it if I can't at least take a chance and back up what I think I'm worth. And, you know, I'll never know unless I try it now. Now, now don't tell me they paid you a quarter point when you went to Salisbury. Oh, yeah. Really? Yeah. Mm, I yeah. find that interesting. I never worked for a quarter point. With no overage. With no overage. Right. <laughs> I so love it. It was pretty, you know, it, I knew no different then. Yeah, sure. I, I, I wasn't, sure. I hadn't been in the mortgage world on that on this typical commission structure. So now, even at a year and six months, my wife tapped me on the shoulder one day. We were driving. She goes, hey, pal, we've got six more months, and we're back across the bridge. You know, well, in those last six months, I did the mortgage for the principal, one of our teachers, um, and, you know, another teacher I went to school, I grew up with uh, for one of my other kids. And so it turns out we realized we have great control over the influences of our children, plus the word of mouth was spreading for me dramatically uh, over that first year because it was it – was, I mean, I called people the first three months. Uh, I moved down by myself while we were trying to sell a house in Baltimore. I called people up to midnight, Monday through Thursday, because there was such a backlog of, of files in here that, that, and every industry was experiencing. It was, you know, it was busy. Nobody was ramped up. Uh, didn't have enough employees. So I called people up to midnight. That was my cutoff. And believe it or not, there wasn't one person that ever got mad. They were just thankful somebody was calling them and telling them what was going on. So it was quite a mess to walk into a nice, organized, complacent, to leave an organized, complacent situation in the marketing department Mm -hmm. and to walk into what was really total chaos. I just couldn't believe that existed at Loyola Federal. So I knew I had my work cut out for me. But down on the Eastern Shore, the word of mouth spreads very quickly. You know, if you do a great job, it really helps you. If if you do a lousy job, it'll put you right out of business. Unlike in the metropolitan areas, Mm -hmm. you can do a lousy job and there's 100 more waiting around the corner. Mm-hmm. Likewise, too, if you do a great job, the word doesn't spread that well because you're a nobody. But down here, you can be a somebody. And qu- and quickly. Yes. Um, did you have any formal training when you went down, or it was like you oh. know hit the road and right? It was just hit the road. It was mainly what I remembered from my first five years. Mm-hmm. So, and that was you know, and that was that first five years had been four years ago. But the ratios were still the same. You know, basically twenty eight thirty six. And lending is a lot of common sense. You know, does a guy have have job stability, you know, I often look at it it as, and what I used when I started out as I was relearning the guidelines, generally I looked at it and said, would I lend this guy my money, my own personal money? You know, that's how I evaluated credit reports, and that's how I looked at the job stability. I knew you had to stay in the same line of work for the last two years, basically, back then. Um, So, 
you know, I just read my guidelines each night. You know, I might read a couple pages each night, uh, which was a hint given to me by one of the senior officers in the lending division. He said, you know, just break it down, read two pages of Fannie Mae every night, and plus look up that night any situations that you came across during the day that you're not sure of. Mm-hmm. And that's what you try to do. So. Now, i tell you what's sticking in my mind, a couple things. One of them, uh, I, I'm sure I will not be forgiven if I don't ask this, uh, at what, because there's a lot of people horror-stricken out there on this quarter point. Uh, at what point did you realize that uh, there really you can get a half point out there? Not for a long time. I mean, not for, not mm-hmm. for truthfully, not for a few years, to tell you the truth, mm-hmm. because I never really have compared myself to other people. Uh, or what others are getting. You know, unlike the ball players nowadays, they all want to be the highest paid. I never, w- when they would print out the production reports, I never looked at the production reports. Never. I might look at it one time or twice a year, and that was it. And obviously, I looked at the end of the year when it was given to me, you know, and they give the awards or whatever, but I'm always, I'm always trying to do the best that I can do. That's one thing I learned through sports. You know, you're not really competing against the other guy. You're competing against yourself. That's what right. is your true potential? You know, and it's just like, at a Todd Duncan seminar a couple of years ago, Peter Vidmar, who is the only gymnast to win yeah. to win a medal in the all-around competition in the Olympics, he he put, hit it right on the head. And this is just how I've lived my life. And he says, you know, how could I beat all these other guys? There are no extra hours in the day. Everybody's practicing till they drop. He goes, all right. So I just practiced an extra 15 minutes every day, and that he won by like one one hundredth of a percentage point. That's right. That got him. Well, I think of myself back in sports. I always stayed after practice in every sport I did, except baseball, because you need somebody to stay after to hit you the ball or to pitch to you. But in wrestling, gymnastics, football, I always stayed after practice, whether I was punting the football or just throwing at a pole because I was quarterback or practicing my moves in gymnastics or practicing takedowns, getting my hips close in against the wall. I always practiced an extra few minutes, and that's what I do at work. You know, you may be cut. When I walked into here in 1986, and I saw this, all these files all over the place, I just said, okay, we've got to break it down. And that's what Peter Vidmar says. You always break everything down to make it more attainable. You don't go for the touchdown. You go for the first down. So when you've got 15 cases sitting in front of you, and, you know, like the refi boom of 1993, you know, one month in March I did 165 applications. Well, you can't do that. Well, you do them, like Greg Frost says, one loan at a time. Mm-hmm. And I would look and say, okay, I'll just get this loan done, and then I'm going home. And I get it done and say, well, let me just look at this one more case, this other case. And then you do that, and first thing you know, you've gone through five or six cases. You know, So by just breaking it down, you can make everything achievable. And that's how you, you, know, you just keep going and going that way, and you're doing the best you can do. And you know, only when a buddy of mine from Baltimore faxed me the commission sheet of, really of a, of a guy he worked with in 1993, about three-quarters of the way through 1993, uh, during that refi crush, he faxed me this guy, the king of the overages, he called the guy, and that's when I saw... <laughs> Should we ask his name? <laughs> no. That's when I really saw, realized, you know, what these guys were getting, because we still weren't getting overages. We couldn't get overages at that point. We didn't get them until, like, 1994 or five. So, you know... I, but I never really thought about that, and that that didn't bother me because what the staff, you know, eventually learned how I operate, and that is that I'm not looking to, pay, to make the buck on this deal. I'm looking to satisfy the customer on this deal because that customer is my referral source for the future, and that's how I got the word of mouth down here. They pretty much everybody knows I will bust my butt to get the case done. And that, you know, the, there's a famous thing. There's a bar, there's a restaurant and a bar right across the river, right across the street from us. And a lot of realtors go over there on happy hour uh, on Fridays. And quite often the lights are on here, uh, you know, at 6 or 7 on Friday night. And, and I've heard, often gotten feedback that the saying over there is, yeah, there's flowers up there. He's still working on those cases. So, you know, you, you know, you lead by example. What do they say? If you set the example, you don't have to set the rules. Well, they know that I will give it my all, and the word spreads, and they know they can trust me. Well, what advice would you have? I, I think you've already given it, but if you had to encapsulate it, uh, uh, for the new loan officers that are starting off, I'm not saying necessarily the first day, but, you know, those are in that first six months period that uh, uh, that can be so difficult. 
Well, it is difficult, especially now. I mean, it's really tough now because, you know, you've got the Internet, you've got the in-house lenders, and, you know, to be a rookie on the street, it's it's like, oh, God, here's another loan officer, you know. Mm-hmm. So you always got to, you just got to wait for that window of opportunity, and you just, and you just, take it and run with it and do the best you can do, whether it's a problem, uh, you know, a crappy loan that somebody's giving you to test you because nobody else could do it, or if you just happen to be at the right place at the right time, you just never know when that windows, when that little crack is going to appear. You know, it's kind of like, I picture it as like a halfback looking for the hole, you know, between the guard and the tackle or whatever, you know, just looking for a little bit of daylight and taking the ball and running with it and trying to, and, and just doing the best you can do and learning and knowing how to follow up without being a pest, but just doing... You know, just keeping a. There's a lot of little blocking and tackling that you can do. Like one of the ways I started was, I was just thinking, how can I, how can I build my business? Well, you know, when I got a deal from a realtor, um, I'd look at the listing agent and I, who I didn't know, and I said, well, how can I get to the listing agent? Well, I just used my fax machine as a marketing tool, and this is what Greg Frost says this too. You know, and and that's exactly what I did. Uh, I would fax up. Uh, the acknowledgement I just took the application, everything looks great um, and i and I told him when we should have approval and when we could go to settlement and I would fax that not only to the selling agent but to the listing agent in hopes that not only will the listing agent see it and with every piece of paper and every acknowledgement from me that holds true i 'm increasing my credibility in their eyes, but hopefully um, you know somebody in the office will see this. You know, and say uh, they'll maybe they'll get it off the fax machine. They'll yell across the office, and say, "Hey, Jane, here's a fax from Flowers over at Crestar, you know, or SunTrust." Um, mm-hmm. And there's a little bit of advertising for me. You know, you, you know I find that uh, you know I do a lot of interviews, of course, and I'm sure there are other uh, loan officers because uh, I only talk to the top people that do this. But you're the first one uh, to, art, uh, to articulate that, and uh, I find that very interesting uh, because in every interview, there's always some new piece of information that uh, people out there can uh, uh, can pick up and run with. Uh, and I think that just sounds like a great idea. Do you do that today? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's, that is <clears throat> now I, most of the agents know me, but at least hopefully somebody will see it that doesn't do business with me. Even though they know me, you know, every, again, every time they see something come across and they see that an agent is dealing with me, it gives credibility to your, to you in their eyes. So that fax machine is a great, great marketing tool. I want to fax out the, now instead of just the acknowledgement that I took the app, obviously it's not an acknowledgement, it's a pre-qualification or a pre-approval now, as we all know, with AUS. Sure. So now, what do you do beyond that? You know, you're always trying to take it to the next level. Well, what I do, and luckily my offices are pretty close to my office, so it's not, you know, an hour drive to my realtor offices, but not only will I fax through the pre-qualification or pre-approval to the agent, but I'll take that original, which is on our colored banner paper, I'll fold it, tri-fold it, put it in my personal brochure with a, with a company pen, and I'll deliver that to the agent, to their office that evening on the way home. That's or great. the next morning on my way back in. So it's, if they're not there, it's, it's either on their desk, on their chair, or in their box. So why do I do that? Because now my personal brochure is a great, great marketing piece, number one, and it's got the slick in there that talks about me a little bit and talks mm-hmm. about the company, but it's color. You know, it's, just, it's a high-quality piece to look at, not just the black and white facts that came through. Isn't it kind of funny that uh, when we I, I was uh, talking with another loan officer on this exact same thing, as a matter of fact, we're talking about faxes, and that is how sometimes low-tech is really better than high-tech. A fax is nothing but a piece of paper going in among millions of others. But as this loan officer pointed out, you know, somebody's got to pull it out, somebody's got to stick it on a table, and people got to look at it. Mm-hmm. Yep. And... Uh... So that that does one thing. Like I said, the next level, the high quality color piece. It's the same wording. It's the same paper, piece of paper. But we took the time to take it to them and give them a pen. You know, hopefully they'll use that pen or they'll have it sitting on their desk or whatever. You know, um, you know, you're always trying to take it to the next level and do something a little bit different. Now, mm-hmm. now also you don't want to overdo it. You know, so like. You know, I don't want to go in there and call them all the time and, and say, hey, you know, I'm not going to call them every other day telling them on the Jones case just for an excuse to talk to them because then you become a pest. You've got to read your customer. You've got to read the realtor. Some realtors, all they want to do is communicate with you by voicemail and fax. 
they don't want to talk to you because their time's valuable. One of my best, best agents, great guy, great personality, he'd much rather talk to me through voicemail because then he can crack his jokes and leave his messages and, and be on his way, and I can do the same thing back to him. You know, he just called me yesterday to play in a golf tournament in June, but we hardly ever see each other. So now some guys will bug them with the phone calls. They're not going to want to deal with you if you're always calling them. Just give them, you know, give them the scoop and let them be on their way. Get it done. That's what they want you to do. What's mm-hmm. the shortest point between shortest distance between two points? A straight line. So, what about when you're um, at this level that you're at now? Uh, I wondered if you'd uh, discuss the issue of pricing uh, and the fact that the margins have become so much thinner now. Uh, as time has go on, there's not as much overage out there. Uh, do you run into uh, pricing issues at all? Sure, all the time. And that's uh, uh, when you asked me about the new loan officers coming on board. In fact, I ran in. We had a uh, corporate seminar a few days ago, and I ran into a few of the young loan officers the night before. And I told them, I said, I said, just hang in there, fellas. You know, I know it's tough. Uh, you know, we're not in a refi boom. There's a lot of competition. I said, but you know, just know your stuff. Be there. Be ready when you when you get the call. You know that's why we got pagers and cell phones and all that stuff. I said and and bank your money. I said I lived on tuna fish and peas for five years. You know because I had no money and but I banked it and I you know was always working and I increased my credibility. So now you know I got to, I have an option of two ways to go. When I'm when somebody's got me beat on price, I can afford to let it go and say, well you know that's a good that's. They, they're much better than we are. You know, that's probably the better choice for you. Or I can get real spiteful if I'm in that mood, and I can still undercut the price and take a hit because you know I've got a bank account to back it up. Do you do that? Yeah. Uh huh. Mm-hmm. I mean, I will. As part of an overall strategy, I assume. <laughs> Actually, some half time it's based on the, my mood. I guess you know <laughs> I'm very. I guess I'm very driven, very possessive, and very competitive. So more often than not, I will try to beat that price because I don't want. With, with the advent of, of technology, it's hard to. You know, it's almost. It's very hard to screw up a deal nowadays. You know, it used to be my right. point of differentiation between me and the competition was my speed and my knowledge. And quite often, I still get the call that customers will say. You know, so and so said to call you that if anybody can figure this out, you can. Uh, another agent the other day that I'm just starting to deal with said, "Well, you know, uh, Bill in our office said you know more than anybody." Well, that's great. So you get, you get that that um, reputation out there. But now with AUS, you know, DU and LP, mm-hmm. it's hard. You know, anybody can stick it in the computer and get an approval. You mm-hmm. know, and limited documentation. I mean, what can you screw up? So, what about when you get to uh, self-employed people? Well, how do you handle that? I, well, I do it myself. I mean, I've done thirty percent of my employee, my customers are self-employed, and always have been. So I know how to read the tax returns. It's no problem. In fact, if they can get the tax return out in front of them, and I've got them on the phone, I tell them what line to look on. And so, you know, we can I can pre-qualify them right over the phone, whereas most guys can't. A lot of loan officers hand it off to somebody else to do the financial analysis. You know, and it's a simple addition, subtraction, calculation. Mm -hmm. You know, it's nothing complicated to it. So, you know, self-employed doesn't intimidate me whatsoever. In fact, you know, that's probably where I can talk to them on their level because having tried to do a few businesses in the past myself and filling out the schedules myself and, you know, doing the tax withholding and all that business, you know, I can talk on their level and I think they can feel that. So, and I let them know about all the customers I do that are self-employed. So, you know, they know that I'm, I'm right on the same wavelength with them. Mm-hmm. Well, going back to the overage situation real quick. Yeah. Um, uh, yes, I may undercut my price to beat that competitor or to match that competitor because I don't want to create a crack for my competition because if they get a foothold in there and they do one, then the realtor learns that, well, he can do it just as good as Rod can do it. I don't want to give them that opportunity. You know, I want to. I want to starve them out. So, <laughs> and and with every, you know, it is it is a, a game of attrition because yes, it is. You know, with every, you know, with all these new loan officers that come on board, how long can they last? You know, it's just like running a race. You know, when you're dragging, you're running a. If you're running a, you know, a, a marathon or a five mile race or whatever, you might be dragging, but you keep your posture. You don't look behind you, and you don't. You keep that same posture like you could go forever, and you want to demoralize the competition. You know, but they want to know, and my competition knows that I will never drop. I'll I'll work 24 hours a day if I have to, and I've been known for doing it. You know, in the past years, but they know that I, you know, 
I will go as hard as I can go and then I won't give up. So there is a mental aspect to the game. So I don't want to give that window of opportunity for anybody to get in there because eventually I know they'll get demoralized and they will give up because mentally they're not as tough as me and some other people. Hmm. So. How do you uh, – normally I don't get into this to later in an interview, but uh, just by the nature of the beast and, and the fact that you are a very driven individual, uh, it raises another issue, and that is how do you uh, – man, especially with the volume you do, uh, how do you manage your time? I think that's going to be of great interest to the people out there with the volume you do. Yeah, well, everybody still thinks I work 20 hours a day, um, but um, uh, I don't necessarily. Uh, sometimes, you know, sometimes I'm still might be in here till 10 or 11 at night, depending on if there's cases that I need to sp- that I want to specifically look at myself. Um, but it took me years to finally realize, you know, to finally get an assistant because I never understood the assistant concept. Never knew there was one. Mm-hmm. All I knew is I was complaining to Loyola about, I need help, you know. And I was so far out beyond everybody else. I mean, my volume was typically like three times what, what this number two guy was. So they couldn't even comprehend what I was doing or what I needed. Um, and then finally, I just, you know, it just said, I got to get somebody and I got an ex realtor to come in just to do some stuff, you know, that well, like we went into laptops years ago. We were like one of the first in the country to do laptops. And luckily I used to, I took a typing course in high school so I can type 60, 70 words a minute. And I was putting all my loans in a laptop and I realized I don't have one waking free second, seven days a week. This is bizarre. This is crazy. This is, was not what I was hired for. I can't even get out to the offices. So I finally got an assistant to do data input, and they helped me with some marketing because I'm always trying to market. And that's another key thing that you got to do. You know, you have to – if you've got some creativity on marketing, that's another point of differentiation nowadays. You know, whether it's birthday banners or, you know, a funny birthday card or something unusual, and we can get to that in a few minutes. Yeah, I'd like to. As okay. a matter of very much so. But as far as the hours go, the assistant – uh, like uh, and again, I refer back to Greg Frost because he was like the king of. The, he's got his own tape series, the Assistance Program, that that's published through Duncan. But you know, you got to list out, and I haven't been real great at this, but you got to list out what the responsibilities and duties are for the assistant. Because if you don't, now you got something else that's a problem. Trying to figure out what they're going to do and what to have them do while they're sitting there, you know, costing you money. So now I have a couple different assistants, a loan officer that's very driven like me, uh, had another territory. I trained him ever since he was an intern in college, and he became a processor. And luckily, having been a processor, and I used to process my own loans my first five years, we know the process of the loan process. So that's our another advantage over other loan officers. We know the flow, and we know what it takes, what proper documentation you need up front. Do you pay your own assistant? Yes. Uh-huh. So, Frank Donnelly does too, and uh, it's I, I been very successful for him. Yeah, I don't know if the you know I don't know if there's a company that really pays for your assistance. You know, I give them a basis point override of my volume, mm-hmm. um, and you can tier that according to their to the value that they bring to the table. Um, so the assistants are really great. You know, you can have one. Maybe you have one that's just a marketing assistant and doing all that stuff, all that communication stuff. I mean, I even had one. Well, usually when I hire a marketing assistant, I even have them do my handwritten cards because anybody's handwriting is better than mine. So you know, and I and I'll have them do do everything from that to just making the courtesy call back, saying, "Hey, Rod, got your message. He's with customers. Can he call you around noon? You know, just something like that, or doing the birthday, or doing the faxes, and doing the pre-qualification uh, letters, or dropping those cards off, uh, the pre-qualification and pre-approval um, forms with the pens. Um, all the marking stuff you can have them do. Well, it turns out my last one that I hired, um, she got to know the agent so well. And and has a very very good personality. She's actually a loan officer assistant for me now. She doesn't do any more marketing because she takes apps, pre qualifies people. She's learned the system. I mean, she jumped in there much faster than what I expected. So you never know. You just kind of now. I'm trying. I'm thinking about taking a third on who is a disgruntled loan officer with a competitor, and again trying to sharpshoot certain agents every quarter because this person has a very good personality comes across very professional and you know trying to pick off these agents and bring them on board with us Mm -hmm. so you know my last one Ann has has already established great relationships with some of my agents that i didn't give enough attention to and so it's kind of falling right into place so 
I'm, I might be in the office, um, you know, for the past year and a half. Um, I, well, a year and a half ago, I made made it a goal to eat dinner with the family at least three nights out of Monday through Thursday. One night I can spend in the office, and then obviously I eat, I'm with the family eating dinner Friday, Saturday, and Sunday night. Saturday I might be in here for a half a day. Sometimes it'll be all day. It depends. And sometimes I won't be in here at all. But my pager is always on, and I do get I get between 10 and 20 pages a weekend uh, to pre-qualify people, take applications, whatever. Now, some top loan officers, you know, they brag that they got rid of their pager and their assistants have their pager, and they don't work weekends and they don't work after five and all this, but I do, and it doesn't bother me because it helps space out the workload, I feel. Mm-hmm. You know, instead of being bombarded on Monday, because being at working in a resort area, there's a lot of activity going on on the weekend. So with the advent of computerization, you know, and in-house mortgage lenders, my attitude is you better be ready and available because otherwise they'll walk down the hall and deal with that guy. You know, so, you know, if they can page me and they can get me right away, that's okay with me. You know, it makes me feel wanted and needed, I guess. Well, what about, uh, do you use a, a mobile cell phone, too? You yeah. keep using the word pager, but... Uh... Well, I have a voice pager, so I, I, I haven't gotten it. I don't carry the cell phone on me all the time uh, because, and I don't always have it on. I've just, it's just, which I probably will switch very soon, and I probably should because it's got a pager capability, but I'll have to change my number. But everybody knows my voice pager, which is my beeper. Right. You know? So they can leave a 15 second message, and they know I'll get right back to them. So I just carry, I just had the pager on me all the time, mm-hmm. and I'll just call them from either cell phone or home or the office or whatever. What exactly do you mean by you'll get back to them pretty soon um, or quickly? Um, does that mean you'll do that on a Saturday? or Sunday? Or oh. What kind of work habits do you have with regard to that? Absolutely. I'll get back to them right away. I mean, as soon as I can. I mean, they know. I mean, quite often they'll page and say, right, i got customers in here. Uh, can you try to give me a call back? And they, if, they, if I get that page, I will call them back. You know, if I'm driving in the car or I'm working out in the gym or, you know, whatever, I will call them back because that's what they've, you know. I think, you know, people want three things nowadays. Quick response, personal attention, simple solutions. That's how I break it down. If I can provide those three things, I'm going to beat the competition. You know, and it's it's a very simple game. And yes, it might take some of my personal time away, but not too long because I'm so quick in taking the application. I can take an application in five minutes, have them pre-qualified. They know how high they can go. The app's done in five minutes, and I'm not cons- and I'm I'm not sitting there pecking away in the laptop. I am handwriting an application, but what I do is when the people call me to get pre-qualified, I'm discreetly taking enough information that I've completed an application. By the time we're done in five minutes, it's done. They don't even know they did it. So I'm not going to say, okay, let's do the application. Well, they're thinking, oh, Christ, this is going to take a half an hour or an hour. Mm-hmm. You know, while I'm pre-qualifying, I'm jabbing into little questions about their age and how long they've lived here and what's the value of their house or whatever. And at the end, say so you qualify for this amount of money, here's the, here's the payment. And by the way, when you find a property, your application is already done. You won't even have to fill out anything. And they go, you're kidding. Nope, it's already taken care of. So, so I know that if I get paged and I'm at my daughter's lacrosse game, you know, and I did it this past Saturday. I got paged twice, and I actually I, I did two prequals, which basically became applications by Monday because they were making offers that day, and it only took me five minutes per call. So I think there's a uh, I think there's a lesson for the listeners out there, because um, and I'm going to f- uh, phrase it a little bit differently, uh, but we're going to come to the same point in the road, and that is. Uh, I found that when I was out there uh, years ago doing my business, that if you were not accessible, uh, there were times you mentioned where, where people have clients in an office. You know, if, if you have a good relationship with a realtor and they have somebody there and they can't get a quick response, well, you know, if that happens once or twice, fine, they go to the next person on the list or whatever. Uh, but if that consistently happens where they not only don't get a quick response, they may not get a response for two, three hours, or sometimes the next morning, at some point in time, you're not on their radar. That's right. I mean, I've, I've had situations where I've called the agent back in 15 minutes, and he already went to another lender. You yeah. know, and that's not my loyal realtors, but I blew a chance to, and if the, the way it happened is because the pager, I left it in my car Friday night, and I didn't realize I didn't have it sitting there in the kitchen and, and until about, 
I don't know, one, the next morning sometime, and a guy just paid me 15 minutes before. But I blew the chance to establish my relationship with that realtor. And that's because on the 14th minute, he didn't know if you were going to call for a day. That's right. And he didn't even think to call, you know, my home or, or whatever, but... You know, I blew my chance. Now, some loan officers will say, I'm not going to let them use me like that. And, you know, I got my personal time. Well, that's fine. I mean, everybody looks at it differently. I, like I said, I look at it like they need me. They, they want me, and I like that. You know, so it's my chance to show my stuff. Now, that goes back to the new loan officers, too. That's going to happen with them. Somebody's going to blow it like I blew it with this guy. And, young loan officer, you're going to be available. And you're going to get the call in that 14th minute, and now's your chance to run with the ball. You know, and that will happen. But I'm not going to let it happen, or I try not to let it happen in my area. You know, and I get, I tell you, I will get pages, and not a lot, but there's, there's some agents that work at night. They don't work in the mornings. They like working at night. And I've got a, a couple of them, and they'll call me at 1030 at night or page me. And I'm, they, they know they would not try not to do it beyond 10, but if it's at 1030, do you think they're just calling to shoot the ball? No. They got a they got a serious buyer and they want an answer now because they want to beat that next offer. You know, you know the the inventory so well right at this point in time that's a shortage of inventory so every deal's critical and there might be five other deals coming in on that property tomorrow. That's why they call me at ten thirty tonight so you know, I can fax it through to them. Yeah, you know I interviewed uh, uh, Jim Caps who's a re you may know him, a regional at the Market Street Mortgage and legend up in the Washington area. He told me uh, we were off the tape, but I believe they have such a shortage of inventory. He told me that he has like 268 people that he is fully pre-qualified uh, that, that can't find properties. They're just literally sitting to you know wait to jump on something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think everybody's got that. Uh, I mean, we've got it here too. I have a whole file drawer full of them. I haven't counted them, but. You know, like last weekend, uh, those uh, I actually got uh, two pages during my one of my daughter's lacrosse game. After the game, went into the office to do the prequal letters, and I got paged two more times. Well, out of those four people, two of them offered list price. Two of them offered over list price. The two that offered list price did not get the property. That's how because five other mm -hmm. contracts came in. You know, and we tried to tell him, you might want to offer a little bit above list price. He said, oh, we don't do that. We'll offer list, okay. You know, so they didn't get the property. But, yeah, there's a, it's quite a, a, a shortage of inventory all over the country, I think. But so, too, in that same light, you better be available because, you know, they want to get it done yesterday, not today. Mm -hmm. So, And that's what I tell, like, when we have college interns in here, that's one of my mottos. I tell them, I say, you know, just like Apollo Creed said to Rocky in, in uh, up Rocky Three on the beach when he's yelling at him, he goes, there is no tomorrow. You know, and they're absolutely right, you know. There is a, you know, you better work in this business with a sense of urgency or else you're going to be, you know, you're going to be left in the dust. Uh, are there any, spe you said we would get back to this a little bit later, are there any special uh, tricks, that's not the right word, but uh, nonetheless one I selected, uh, are there any special tricks uh, that you use in the business that help differentiate you and you well, deal with your clients? Well, luckily, you know, I do have, I'm somewhat creative in marketing and I'm, I'm always trying to think of something that's, you know, maybe a little bit off the wall, but not too unprofessional, you know, to try to set myself apart. Like I said, in the past, my speed and used to set me apart. When everybody was doing 60 days to get a loan done, I was 45. When they were 45, I was 30. When they were 30, I was 20. Mm -hmm. Now it's a matter of minutes, you know, and everybody can do a 10-minute approval now. Well, one of the other things I've always talked to, talked in terms of is I talk in finite terms and I realized this from buying rental properties and having to do my loans through other lenders because I only have one with my company and when they process the loan I know I'm qualified but they never told me specifics as to okay when are we going to get the deal done you know when's it going into underwriting when can I go to settlement they'd say okay when we get this in and that in then we'll get into underwriting get the approval done and then you can go to settlement well when you know, like I talk in finite terms. We always begin with the end in mind. So that way, nothing falls through the cracks. I have a four-foot by six-foot settlement board in the middle of the office. And so when I take an application, I am asking them, what's the proposed hopeful settlement date that you're aiming for? And that is the last phrase I end every conversation, and I mean every conversation with my customers. If I talk to this guy three times a day, 
again, it's going to be my last phrase, my last question at the end of the conversation, so I know where we're heading. And I tell them, okay, we'll have you approved today or approved tomorrow. We'll send the documents out to you. You sign them, send them back. Um, that takes about a week, and by that time, we'll have the appraisal in. So we'll have the instructions to your attorney in 10 days. And if you want to move your settlement date up, fine, you just let us know. But I talk in terms, let's say I'm missing the appraisal. Appraisal is supposed to be in in 48 hours or 24 hours. I'm always talking in finite terms. So it helps to make the invisible visible to the customer. Because, you know, they only do this a few times in their life. They're in a twilight zone. They're floating out there, and they don't know. And if they don't hear from you, they think you forgot about them. Mm -hmm. I did. I did, and I'm in the business. So if you make the invisible visible, what happens next? You tell them what happens next. You're going to get the printed documents. You won't have to fill out a thing. You just sign where it's checked and return it with the items that I've listed on the front, uh, on the front checklist. And those items are, if you want to write them down, blah, 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 and you can fax them if you'd like to. Um, and then once I get them back, by that time I'll have the appraisal done, and then we'll have the instructions over, over to the title company, and you're ready to go to settlement. In fact, I'll call your agent right now uh, and tell them that you're pre-qualified, and I'll fax you pre-approval over uh, today sometime or tomorrow. See, and I'm telling them what I'm doing. So besides talking in finite terms, my marketing aspects, um, I tr you know, if I see something in the paper where they've, uh, you know, earned a CRS or a top producer or whatever, you know, I cut it out and I have these little, you know, I saw these um, uh, Dilbert mints, um, you, you know, Dilbert, the cartoon mm -hmm. character. Well, there's mints out called accomplish mints, manage mints, perform mints. Um, and I, my kids gave me some of these from a candy store at Christmas, and I went, these are really great. So I went on to Dilbert.com and ordered a, a few cases of them. So I put them, you know, I, I, when I, I clipped out the article in the paper, and I put it in a Crestar note card, and I handwrite the card saying, you know, congratulations, uh, great job. Um, you know, hope we can do more business together this year or whatever. And I put those, uh, the clipping of the article and the Dilbert accomplishments in there. Um, and I also got these little note cards, motivational note cards. That look, they're maybe an inch by an inch, and they open up in a flap, and they're from Compendium in Washington State. I got them from that company. I saw them at a Duncan seminar, and I taped one of them in there. You know, just a little thing. Always trying to set. Don't just send them a card. I'm trying to send them a card that's different that nobody else would have ever thought to do. You know, nobody's seen the Dilbert Mints, um, and plus that little Compendium card. Nobody's ever seen those things either. Um, now, there's a co here's how you're always trying to take it to the next level. I was talking to one of our loan officers the other day. He's got the compendium cards, and he puts them in a note card, but he just throws them in the card. He doesn't tape them to the upper flap. You know, I round off the tape. I stick it on the back so you can't see the tape, and I stick it to the, the, the top flap when you open up the note card. Well, he also doesn't read the card, the the, uh, the compendium motivational. And I said, Steve, you better read that stuff. I mean, it doesn't it doesn't look bad since it's opened a little bit, but you got to open it and match it with the personality of the agent. I said, think about the agent that doesn't like a lot of fluff. The shortest distance between two points is you know is a straight line. That's the kind of guy he is. And you're going to get him one that says, let's see if I got one here. Oh. When one door opens, another. When one door closes, another, another opens. Yeah. But we often. Chinese thing. Yes. Well, 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 here's how the thing goes. But we often look so long and so regretfully upon the closed door that we do not see the one which has opened for us. Now, do you think this guy wants that? <laughs> no way. You know? And he started laughing. He goes, "God, you're right. I never thought of that." I said, "He's not going to want to deal with you. You send him three of them, and you're history. <laughs> you're dead." Yes. You know, get him one that says, "Hey, we can't always be right, but we can always be professional. Short, <laughs> right. sweet, to the point." That's the one. So I always read them before I put them in that card. You can bet your bottom dollar I do. So, and that's another thing. You know, we got to be semi psychologists. You know, you're always trying to match something up to their personality type. Um, uh, talk about birthdays. Very simple thing. You know, I don't just send them a card. Every year I do something different. When, um, you know, uh, I did a loan for a guy at a at a wine and beer store. So I got champagne. I got several cases of champagne. I didn't just get the cheapest champagne. I looked at the best looking champagne bottle. Okay. So mm -hmm. I noticed another guy tried to copy me and he got this, the cheapest champagne. It was just a plain white bottle. Well, mine was dark green, white label, red trim, and gold lettering. 
very high class. Now, some of the agents, this was five years ago, some of the agents still have it on their credenza. You, you know what? I just saw a neat one. I have to tell you this. I have a friend of mine, that, uh, a close friend of mine, owns Clyde. It's a restaurant chain in Washington. And yeah. uh, we go over, we stay with them all the time. And um, I was over there looking for a gift, went into uh, Total Beverage out in McLean. And they uh, there on the shelves, uh, there was this wine bottle with from uh, Napa Valley. Uh, it was about uh, I don't know twenty five dollars or whatever. Had the most incredible picture of Marilyn Monroe on it that you have ever seen. Probably the best picture that was ever taken of her. It was stunning. Uh, she looked professional, beautiful, all the other things. This stuff was just jumping over the uh, off the shelves. I bought a case of this stuff and gave it out to clients and friends and whatever. And uh, they just they still keep it. What was it called? Uh, it, I don't I don't know what it was called. Just had this incredible picture. And uh, you know when you do that, you have to pay the estate and it's all trademarked <laughs> and everything like that. But but it was just unbelievable. People were uh, I mean this uh, uh, total beverage uh, for those that don't know around the country. Uh, just literally it probably has a hundred thousand different brands of wine and everything. And here people are standing around in a group looking at this incredible thing. So you're you're right when you can differentiate your product, uh, it makes a big difference. Well, the um, you know besides the the champagne. I did that one year. The next year, um, Cal Ripken uh, did uh, you know hit twenty one thirty one. Okay, when he with his consecutive game streak, mm -hmm. when he beat Lou Gehrig, sure. and Wheaties came out with him on the box. That's right. Well, I saw it in Sports Illustrated and went straight to the grocery store. They, and luckily, they just got them in, and I bought like you know ten cases of them or, or 15 cases of them and and we created a flyer with a baseball diamond on it and said uh uh you know like we'd send it and and the, the realtor newsletter prints the birth dates of all the agents in it every month all right so we have our master list so for those agents and a lot of agents that i deal with i would do this flyer on there and says um john um you keep going and going just like cal Happy birthday, or whatever, and I I would tape that to the Cal Ripken box very gently, so it wouldn't rip the box, mm -hmm. and and I would send it over to them. It's for their birthday. Great so, idea. Yeah, nobody else would think of that. Um, another year, I just went with a Crest or a company pen and Avanti. I found these Avanti cards that were hysterical, um, and I got a bunch of them, and I used them because they, they were very hard to find. You, there was only one place on Eastern Shore that sold these cards, um, and so I used that one year. Now, I this year, um, I ran into, um, at Christmas time, over at Sam's Club, they had these Monopoly coffee mugs, shrink wrapped, wrapped up with um, tea and coffee biscuits, special coffee, tea bags in the mugs and sticking out of the mugs, shrink wrapped with, tied with a ribbon at the top, and one kind is called Boardwalk Brew, which is for my Ocean City agents. The other ones are called Park Place Perk, which I use that for the Salisbury agents. So I got two cases of them. I got like a few hundred of them because they were only four ninety five each. And I went, this is too good. Actually, I only bought one case, and when I went home, I went, this is too good to pass up. I can't. This is so unique. You know, this looks like it costs 20 bucks. So I went back and got another case, mm -hmm. and I, I give them to the realtors for their birthday. Um, and everybody loves them to death. And we do it with a birthday banner that we just print out our computer. It's like a three-foot-long banner that just says, you know, happy birthday, John, from Rod and the Crestar team. And, they, and it's got a little uh, uh, self-adhesive tapes on the back and it, we give them instructions on how to do it all you do is peel it off and stick it up on your wall they always stick it up on their wall they always call and thank them for the mug and the and the birthday banner so nobody's going to go to that extent so maybe that whole thing cost me seven bucks to do but man it's well worth it isn't it amazing and i think after people uh, listen to enough of these interviews uh, they're going to pick up a couple things that uh, it seem to go uh, uh, in a straight line from the top all the way down and that is it's amazing how realtors and clients and and uh, agents really like getting these five seven dollar things it's the fact that you thought enough to get them something well you go back to the three things i talked about just as the customers want quick response personal attention and simple solutions so too do the realtors we all do you quick response i'm responding to their pages the personal attention i'm giving attention to them personally with the birthdays or their accomplishments and the simple solutions i'm doing my pre-qual or my pre-approval slam bam let's go to settlement you know so i've accomplished those three those three 
um, items with my realtors as well. You know, and you're right. I mean, anything. I mean, if I'm in Sam's Club or someplace and I see, you know, like one day I was in there and they had these great Parker pens. I mean, really nice pens. Oh, you know, you could get them in quantity, the bulk quantity, and they're on they're on uh, discount for like four bucks. I mean, it's like, geez, these things are normally ten bucks. Or Schaefer pens, where I got a whole bunch of them, really nice. And I just, now I save them. I don't bang them all out at once. I save them. I've got a whole marketing, four marketing tours of of stuff in there, and I pop them out like, you know, like instead of uh, the Dilbert mints. After I finish doing the Dilbert mints this year, maybe I'll use the pen the next year, or I'll use the pen for something else. You know, you just if you see a deal and you see something that strikes you, and I'm always thinking in terms of. That's why people say, "How do you come up with this stuff?" Well, I guess maybe I'm always thinking in these terms because I might see something at the X. Exxon station in the in the in the you know the little food place that they got something at the counter that's kind of unique looking um, that's maybe something for golf and I know that you know Doug my realtor loves to play golf I mean he he thinks this is humorous you know so well, I, one day I, I on a driving range and I don't play a lot of golf but I broke a, the club head off of an old club and so what did I do I I I, I um, uh, I sanded it off smooth, and I spray painted it gold, and I put it on a piece. And I, and I didn't put it on a piece. But I just sent it to Doug um, with some joke because we had played in a tournament a few months before, and I don't know what I said, but you know, just something, just something to let them know that we're thinking of them. I, I think where you're headed here, and we're starting to get near the end of our time, uh, is that uh, personal relationships and developing those personal relationships uh, are, are really a, a key here. And, but you don't overdo it. I mean, then they will tell their in-house mortgage lenders, you know, to say they're just waiting for the time the manager says, well, why don't you deal with uh, the in-house guy? You go, well, what does he do for me? Look at this stuff Flowers does for me. You know, he gives me updates. He, you know, gives me this little trinkets. He sends me, pays for, you know, to play in this golf tournament or takes me, you know, like the success seminars that Peter Lowe puts on throughout the country. Right. I've attended them. I took 10 of the agents to that last year. They thought it was the greatest thing they'd ever seen. Mm. You know, and it was cheap. It was, and it was fun. And we all got something out of it. Was Zig Ziglar on the agenda? Yeah, Zig was on there. Um, he's getting a little older now, but he's still great. Oh, yeah. He's, he, he and, uh, Les Brown are yeah. like the two best live guys I've ever seen. I mean, and, yep. you know, I, I couldn't agree more, but yeah, especially on Zig, I'm a, uh, a big Zig Ziglar fan. As, as, I mean, Zig, even though he'll tell the same stories, you never get tired of hearing him. Yeah. Now, and he he, went, so he he's like that Henny Youngman, you know, king of the one-liners, <laughs> and uh, I mean, he, he zigs, he's just sitting there, and it's like it's I I don't take heroin, but I mean, I, I suspect it's like a heroin rush. I mean, you just listen to stuff, and it just keeps going in, and it's just like adrenaline. Mm-hmm. By the time Zig Ziglar is finished, as you know, I mean, you're just walking out on cloud nine. That's right. I'm not sure how much you remember the next day, but you just know you had one hell of an experience. Mm-hmm. Well, and it's great for you know like. When you have to speak at places, and quite often I will speak at, you know, whether it's a realtor meeting or a convention or to our group of loan officers or whatever. I mean, you know, I use Zig quite a lot because I got a bunch of his tapes and I grab little pieces of mm-hmm. you know, of inspiring information here and there. And uh, you know, like last year, they asked me to kick off a, a motivate a sales rally for two days, and they wanted me to get everybody pumped up. Well, I thought of Arnold Schwarzenegger getting pumped up, so I used his accent. I created a character called App Man. I had a Captain America mask, a red turtleneck, a white cape that I spray painted App Man on it. You know, black running tights. But mm-hmm. all my all my content was strictly from Zig Ziglar. You know, I mean, I used all his stuff. Just about, you know, you know, you got to get a check up from the neck up. You know, mm-hmm. and all that kind of stuff. And um, just all kinds of things. But you know, if you if if you write down some of this stuff. You can always use it, and it helps everybody else. Yeah. Going back to the things that you do for the agents and everything, one thing I'd just like to stress is you don't want you to get over- about a minute. <laughs> well, you don't want to overdo it. Okay, you know you got to be dis- you know got to think of what will get their attention, but you don't send them some gigantic hundred and fifty dollar basket of fruit. You know something that's that's just obnoxious. Mm-hmm. So I'd like I'd like to kind of end on that high point. Actually, I'd like to end with Zig Ziglar because it really does put you on a high and highly recommend those people out there that have a chance to do the Pierre Lowe's and Les Browns to uh, uh, take the time to do it. Uh, look, I, I'd like to thank you very much. This probably went faster uh, in terms of uh, uh, a language than any interview that I've, I've done in, in a long time. Uh, very profound, a lot of very good points in this, and I really can't thank you enough for taking your time to talk to us. No, sure. Anytime. Great. Thanks so much, Rod. Okay, sir.